Well, good morning, Evangel. Glad you're here this morning. Welcome to uh, the end of summer. It's Labor Day weekend, and uh, so I'm glad you're here this morning. Looking forward to a great time together, and uh, a lot of people watching online, I'm sure, this morning. Welcome to you as well. If this is your first time here in the building or your first time watching online, uh, text the keyword on the screen to 94000, 94000. Let us know you're here. You can fill out an online connect card there and uh, just kind of get some more information about the church. We'd love to, love, love to make contact with you, and so text that keyword to 94000. Um, let me begin this morning as we usually do with, with announcements. I got a bunch of them, so I'm going to talk fast. Hang on. All right? Midweeks. Uh, our midweek starts a week from this Wednesday. September the 15th kicks off our fall sessions uh, for midweek. The adult Bible study uh, will be back in uh, Second Kings, Awana, uh, student ministries, everything going on starting a week from this Wednesday, 10 days away. Now, here's the key thing you need to remember. This year, everything starts at 645. 6.45, all right? So if you're used to Awana, you got an extra 15 minutes for dinner. Use it wisely. If you're used to adult Bible study, you got to be here 15 minutes early. But 6.45. Now, the reason we're doing that is just so everything starts at the same time. We used to have Awana at 6.30 and everything else at 7 and you know, kind of all that dead time in there. We're going to start everything at 6.45. And so keep that in mind. We'll remind you of that as it gets closer. Uh, but that's going to be uh, all year this year. We're planning on a 6.45 start time for that. So that's September the 15th. We kicked that off. Uh, speaking of fall, a bunch of fall activities coming up. We have um, men's Bible studies, ladies Bible study. We have uh, Financial Peace University see a number of different things going on. If you have questions about that, let us know. You can sign up on the Church Center app. Uh, if you go to Church Center, if you're familiar with that, you can download it. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, you can still download it. Punch in Evangel Baptist Church or just click ch churches near you. Evangel Baptist Church will be on there. And uh, you can get more information. You can sign up for groups. Look at groups there. And you can sign up for the men's Bible study, ladies Bible study, Financial Peace uh, University. And so uh, keep those things in mind. Next Sunday, September 12th, we're going to observe communion together after the morning service. So I hope you'll plan on being here for that. And uh, that'll be next Sunday, September 12th. We are also next Sunday, September 12th, going to have a special business meeting of the church to, for two items of business uh, for the members. Uh, the first is, um, we've talked a lot about the Welcome Center project out here, and uh, the idea for those of you who are not familiar with this, everything between this wall and the uh, restrooms out here is going to go away. This is going to be a totally open area, uh, a welcome center. It's the, it's the most prominent area in our building. Everybody who comes in, no matter which door you come through, this one or that one, you're going to see that right away. We're going to clear that out, make it a beautiful welcome area uh, where people can congregate to talk. Uh, they can get information about church. We're going to have a nice new welcome desk there where you can sign up for stuff and get information about the church, all kinds of things. We raised money for that in our anniversary offering. We've had uh, some special gifts come in, and uh, what we're going to do next week is vote to spend up to $80,000 in addition to that to finish the project. Now, it's a lot of money. I get that. But it's a very important thing for us. I think the potential of this, of this place is just, it's going to be a beautiful area. Uh, now, where that money is going to come from is, is from money we have on hand. Some of you know a lot of the, um, the cash reserves that we have are money that's been raised over the past for building projects from years ago. And some of you remember that. We spent some of it on the AV system in here a number of years ago. We've done some things like that. So we have that money in hand. We also have a surplus of money from the past year. The church, you guys have been so faithful in uh, giving, and uh, we actually have more money uh, in our hands uh, than we've spent this year. I don't say that to discourage you from giving. Uh, we still have bills to pay, so keep that up. But, but God's blessed us through the faithfulness of, of the people here, and, and so we have some of that money on hand. Uh, the $80,000 is, is not going to kill us. We have the money here, and uh, it's given. Uh, so let's spend it on a great project. So we're going to vote to spend up to $80,000 uh, in addition to what we've already received. Uh, the second item of, of voting that we're going to have next week will be a contribution of $5,000 uh, to uh, Mark Blackwell in South Africa. Uh, they have some special needs. South Africa has been hit very hard uh, by the virus, and they have some special needs with their churches that they're trying to meet. And so we as a church, again, with the with, uh, uh, money that we have on hand here, uh, we have the ability to help them. And so we're going to uh, have a second ballot uh, provision to spend, uh, to send Mark Blackwell uh, $5,000 to help uh, 
uh, meet the needs of the churches there in South Africa. So those two things will be on the ballot. If you're a member, uh, today or early tomorrow, you will get an email that will explain this, and on that email will be a link for you to vote online. Okay, so one option for voting would be vote online. You go on there, put your name as usual, click that you are a member, and I will verify that. And uh, then you'll have an option to vote yes or no on $80,000 for the Welcome Center Project and yes or no on $5,000 for the Blackwells. You can also vote as a second way through absentee ballots. There are ballots available today back, back here. There will be some ushers after the service. You want to grab one, you can fill out an absentee ballot. They'll give you an envelope, put it in the envelope, write your name on that, and uh, you can do that this morning. Next week, we will have paper ballots here as well. The online voting will close next Saturday night. Okay, so you can do that all week long until next Saturday night, and the official vote and the tally will be next Sunday. If you have questions about those things, please let me know. See one of the deacons, see Pastor Stephen, Pastor Jerry. Uh, uh, we'll get some information to you. We want to be as, as transparent as we can. And so if you're unfamiliar with that or you got questions, please let us know. We'd love to answer those questions for you. All right? That's all the announcements I have this morning. Let's have a great time together. I want to begin our service this morning in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus, as you know, Jesus had a lot of critics. Um, he, um, people didn't like him because of his teaching, because of what he stood for, because of what he did as the Son of God. And there was a group of people who outright rejected him. And they were Jews. They were people who had the Old Testament. They should have expected Jesus. They should have expected this Messiah, but when he showed up, they didn't like him. They didn't want anything to do with him. Now, here's what Jesus said. In Matthew 21, 42, he says, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This, this, this Messiah that you're rejecting, he is the chief cornerstone. Me. And you're rejecting me. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on, over, on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. The promise of Jesus is that he is the cornerstone of the church. He is the cornerstone of our lives. He is the cornerstone of all creation. Everything is built on him. And we'll worship him this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. As we sing together this morning, let's worship him because he is the chief cornerstone. Don't reject him. There's a lot of people who made that mistake over the years, and the stone fell on them and crushed them. Jesus promises hope to all who will come to him. Let's rejoice in that hope this morning. If you're here for the first time trying to figure this all out, this is where it begins. What is the cornerstone you can build your life on? Jesus is the answer. Let's stand together as we sing this morning. Cornerstone. <laughs>
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, they died and in memory found, dressed in his righteousness alone. be seated. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in hearts, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hiding in thee is a wonderful old gospel song, and um, It's one that reminds us in the sorrows of life when the sea billows roll, run to him. Hide in him because uh, he is there for our rest. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe right now you feel like you're in the midst of some really big sea billows. And uh, if you don't feel like that now, it probably won't be long until you do. At some way, in some way in your life, you're going to face some of the trials of life in a broken world. And I want to encourage this morning to find rest in Christ. Find rest in him because he has promised to give it to us. Uh, It may not always look exactly like we want it to. 
right? It, you know, and, and one of the things that we'll talk about this morning in, in the, when we get to the message in a few minutes is the fact that sometimes God has some hidden purposes in our lives. And those hidden purposes sometimes bring some pain. And we want to escape from it. And, and I get that. I want to escape from it as well. But in those times of pain, the answer is run to Christ because he's enough for us. Run to Christ because he's promised to give us hope. He's promised to give us rest. As we begin this morning, I want to give a few moments of silence for you to pray and ask God uh, to help you find rest in him. Uh, maybe for you that starts with salvation this morning. You come to Christ and say, Christ, I have no other hope. I'm coming to you alone this morning, trusting you to forgive my sins and save my soul. You're the only one who can do it. That's the first place of rest this morning. Maybe for you the place of rest is, is, is you are a Christian. You've been falling well, but the struggles are, are overwhelming you. And you're not sure where to turn this morning. And I would encourage this morning to say, Jesus, I want to find rest in you. I'm coming to you. I want to find rest in you. I'm going to hide myself in you. Whatever it is for you this morning, in this moment of silence, ask God to help you to find rest in him this morning. He's our cornerstone. He's the rock in which we can hide. Ask him to help you do that this morning. Let's have a moment of silence for prayer. In just a moment, I'll lead us. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are a good Savior, a great Savior. You are the creator of all things. You're the one who rules over all things. And yet you are gentle and humble in heart. And you have promised to all who are weary and heavy laden, you have promised rest if we'll come to you. And so this morning, we want to come to you to find rest from the burdens and the sorrows and the worries of this present age. You're in control of this present age, and you have some hidden purposes that sometimes you're carrying out in our lives. In the midst of that, calls us to run to you, to hide in you, to take your yoke upon us and learn from you, to find rest for our souls. I pray this morning that, that you would do that for us, Teach us what it means to allow the gospel to be at work in our lives, transforming us and changing us and giving us fresh hope. Pray this morning for those who are um, in sorrow, in pain, in, in worry and anxiety. Help them this morning to find rest for their souls. Help them this morning to be reminded of the truth that you are enough for, for them, that in you are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that in you is everlasting hope and comfort. Father, calls this morning to run to you and find that hope you promised. Maybe there's some here this morning who are listening in or, or even here in the building for the very first time, and they're not quite sure how to put the pieces of life together. They know there's got to be something. Help them this morning. They would see that that thing that they need is you. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives eternal hope forgiveness, comfort and sorrow, encouragement in the journey that we have. Bring them to yourself this morning by your great grace and the power that you have to open the eyes of the blind. I pray this morning for those who are struggling in their faith that you would confirm in them that following you is worth it, that even in the big, difficult things you ask of us, your grace is sufficient for us. And you will enable us to live for you and with you. I pray this morning for this community that we're in all around us. There are thousands of people who, who don't have a church. They have no idea what the gospel, what the hope of salvation is in Christ. I pray this morning that you would, would, would draw them to yourself. Draw them to a place in their lives where they turn and open their eyes and, and see Christ as the one who can, who can give them forgiveness and hope. 
I pray this morning that you would uh, draw them to yourself to see their own sinfulness and see, the, see the, that, that life can only be found in Christ. I pray that you would build your gospel up in this community, through our church and, and other gospel preaching churches around us this morning, that the gospel of Christ might be made clear, that your church would be built up and added to as people respond in faith. All over the world this morning, your church is gathered. And where every place where the name of Christ is spoken this morning, where the message of the gospel is preached, save people for the fame of your name, for the glory of your grace. Build up your church this morning. Encourage us here. Meet with us. Use this time to shape us and to teach us more about who you are and help us to respond to it with confident hopefulness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
What a great song. Church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. And um, that's what we're here about. This is Christ's church. I know sometimes I say, this is my church. And I like that. I like that people take ownership. I like they think they belong here. And I know what we mean when we say that. And I always want to remind us that when we say that, we remind ourselves it's really Christ's church. And we're here because of his grace. And we want to build our lives on him. We want to build, us, build our church on him. And see people come and, and rest on that cornerstone, which is Jesus. Take your Bibles this morning and turn in uh, them to the book of Philemon. Philemon. Uh, if you turn fast, uh, you'll probably miss it because it's probably one page in most of your Bibles. If you're using a device, it's maybe only one page on that, depending on how big your device is. I'm going to read the whole book this morning. Like I can say it's short. So, Philemon. Not even a chapter in it. It's all one chapter, so you don't really say Philemon chapter 1. It's just Philemon. It's in the New Testament, just after the book of Hebrews, or just before the book of Hebrews, after Titus. All right? Let's read. Follow along. I'll read. Be up on the screen for you. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, Yet for love's, sakes, I, love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you, since I'm a person such as Paul the aged, now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who was formerly useless to you, but now is useful both to you and me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was, for this reason, separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord." If then you regard me as a partner, accept them as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time also, prepare for me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers... I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. These are the words of God, perhaps out of all the New Testament, the most personal of Paul's letters. Um, the most, um, most of them, and this is written to a church, but it's really directed at one man, a man named Philemon. And as we study this together this morning, I hope that we'll find hope of the gospel, how the gospel changes our lives, and, and really find the challenge that the gospel wants to present to all of us this morning. As we usually do, I want to sing a prayer together, speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. And I want us together this morning, maybe you're brand new here again, and, and I want you to pray this this morning as a prayer of your heart that God would speak to us through his word as we study it together this morning. Let's sing it together. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and 
and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Father, would you speak to us today through your word? Use it to build up our faith. Use it to challenge our faith. Use it to change us for the sake of your glory and for our good and the good of those around us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Look look around you this morning. Uh, Not long enough to be awkward. Just long enough to notice there's a bunch of people around you. And, And those are people that you have relationships with to one degree or another. And some of you say, yeah, don't remind me. Because you look at those relationships, some of them are really good. And, and those are the people, you know, you see once every two or three weeks. Of course, the relationship's good. You don't have enough time to get any kind of spat with them, right? But, but some of you, you look around and say, yeah, there's somebody right there. Yeah, I really don't like that person. Uh, I, I don't want to see them. That, that's really causing a lot, of, a lot of problems in my life. And, and you, you know, it's impossible to live life without some kind of relationship. And it's impossible to have relationships without some kind of trouble. It's going to happen. It's part of, 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 of living in a broken world. It's part of living in a world where sinful people, as, as hard as we want to try to be holy before God, is, and, and that's assuming we're trying to be holy before God, we're trying to walk after Christ. In a world of broken people, we're going to have a lot of broken relationships and a lot of broken problems. It's part of life, and it can be one of the most distressing parts of life. And some of you have experienced that, that in, in your life you're experiencing a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow and a lot of heartache because of some kind of relationship that's been broken. Somebody's done something to you, and, and you feel that pain immensely. And, and, and maybe it is that you've done something to somebody, and you feel that pain immensely. Or maybe in the worst case, you've done something to somebody, and you don't even feel it. You don't care. See, relationships are, are part of life, and broken relationships are part of life. Somebody, a uh, Christian author, wrote a book entitled Relationships, A Mess Worth Making. They are a mess at times, and, and yet they are worth making. Some of you have those relationships that at some point got so messy you wished you never had it, or wished you could get out of it. And then it dawns on you, I gave birth to this. I can't exactly disown it now, or, or I married this, and, and now, or I work with it. And, and, you, and you say, what do I, what do, I do now? Um, how do we deal with relationships? There's all kinds of techniques. There's all kinds of methods that people teach. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous was um, uh, a relation book of all time was a book by Dale Carnegie entitled How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's all about relationships, right? Now, there's a lot of good stuff in that book. I read it years ago. A lot of good stuff. Um, but so often what we do in relationships is, is we become very pragmatic what will work? Uh, we become very selfish. What will work for me? Right? How can I get what I want out of this? And, and in fact, one of, the, um, one of the principles of relations that many people live by is, if I give you what you want, then you'll give me what I want. And there are books that will teach you how to give somebody else what they want, so they will give you what you want. Now, one of the things in Dale Carnegie's book, you know how to, uh, you know how to win a fight? Just agree with them. Because once you agree with them, there's nothing else to fight about, and you can go on and do, do the next step, all right? Um, all kinds of things about relationships. We come to this, this book this morning, this little short letter, Philemon. It's a book about relationships. And, and really, there's, there's three people in three relationships. And, and of course, Christ, kind of, kind of the fourth Maybe the first, the foundation of it. But, but three people in three relationships, uh, Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. And you have Paul, he's the apostle. Right? He calls himself here. In fact, Paul is aged. He's old. I don't know what point in this life. It's, it's towards the end of his life, most assuredly. Probably sometime maybe in the late 50s or early 60s. Um, Paul is nearing death. He's nearing the point where he's run his race. And, and uh, we don't know how far in the future that is because 
Like, you know, you write letters today. Uh, well, no, we don't write letters today, right? We send emails and texts. But, but you go back and you see the date on it. There's no such date on the letters like that. But we think it's probably sometime late 50s, early 60s. Paul is an old man. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. There's a guy named Philemon. Philemon is a rich man who uh, has um, a big business, a big household. Uh, he is uh, one who is a slave owner. He is one who is a Christian. And, and somebody think right off, well, how does that fit together? Talk about it in a moment. He's one, the church meets in his house, which meant he probably had a reasonable sized house. Now remember back in those days, they didn't have buildings like we have today. Those really didn't start until probably Constantine 300, 400 when, when church buildings are, are, are possible. Uh, up until that time, in most cultures, Christian, Christianity was an illegal religion, so you didn't meet in public buildings because you really couldn't. Uh, once it became kind of openly acceptable, you got a buildings. And so today, we meet in a big church building. Back in ancient times, they were just met in somebody's house. Philemon was a place where the church met. And, and then the last guy is named Onesimus. He's a slave, a runaway slave. Now, we piece all this together from the letter, and, and remember these letters in the New Testament are often like hearing one side of a phone conversation. And, and you've probably been riding in the car with somebody who's talking on the phone, and you hear them talking, and by hearing what they're saying, you're kind of imagining what the other person is, is saying, right? And you can kind of piece it together what they're talking about. That's what this is. Paul is writing a letter, and by writing a letter, we kind of can, can piece together what the issue is. Here's the issue. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon, and Onesimus ran away. He left. Ends up in Rome, hundreds of miles away, and when he ends up in Rome, somehow he comes in contact with a man named Paul. And that's pretty remarkable, right? You travel hundreds of miles away to a city where you think you don't know anybody, and turns out you end up probably, I, I imagine, in prison. You end up in prison with a guy who knows your boss. Like, man, the irony, out of all the people I could have been in prison with, it had to be you? But it turns out to be one of those hidden things that God was up to. And God was doing something in their life that was going to transform things. It was going to radically change things. What are the relationships? There's three people. There's three relationships. A relationship between Paul and Philemon. A relationship between Paul and Onesimus. And a relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. And somehow all three of these are coming together in a letter that teaches you and I something about relationships and the work of the gospel in them. I said to you, Onesimus was a slave, and Philemon was a slave owner. And I just want to say up front, you know, because a lot of people say, well, how in the world can a Christian have slaves? And why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? And let me try to give you a brief answer to that question this morning as we start off. First of all, in ancient times, slavery was, was a very common part of the economic system. It's just the way it was, and still is in some parts of the world, although slavery looks different in some ways. Now, here's most of us. When we think about slavery, most of us think of, of the slavery of the 1800s, uh, or 17, 1800s in our own country that was largely race-based, and, um, and, and uh, in, in many respects involved uh, abuse and mistreatment. And I want to say this morning, the Bible unequivocally condemns the slave trade. Unequivocally. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul condemns what is there called kidnapping. And when you hear kidnapping, what you think of is a guy in a you know, freaky white van who stops by the street corner and tries to entice little kids to jump in on the way home to school. That's not what this was. Kidnapping in 1 Timothy chapter 1 in the first century, kidnapping was buying and selling. So it, was, it was capturing somebody and taking them and selling them as a slave. Okay? The Bible unequivocally condemns uh, that kind of slavery. All right? The Bible also unequivocally condemns the mistreatment of slaves. There's no place in the Bible for a slave owner to beat up or mistreat his slaves. Now, it doesn't outright condemn the economic system because in many respects it was necessary and common. Now, today we don't have the categories in our modern life today in America that existed in ancient times. And they didn't have the categories that you and I have. So most of you have a job. 
right? And uh, the reality is um, you got to work every day or stay home and work every day, whatever the case happens to be for you, right? And um, you could quit your job tomorrow and go find another one, right? Now, it might be hard to quit your job and go find a better paying job because maybe you've been there 10, 20 years. You've kind of worked your way up the, up the ladder, so to speak. Um, but you quit your job and go find another one. They couldn't do that. In ancient times, you didn't really have the, what, what we call at-will employment, where, hey, I'm going to apply at McDonald's or, or Burger King or Ford or, or GM or whatever it is. It just wasn't that kind of world. Um, it was a different kind of world. Slavery was often something somebody was born into. If, if your uh, parents were a slave, uh, you were born into slavery. Uh, a condition as a slave. Many times slavery uh, came about by prisoners of war. If you were, went to battle and you were on the losing team, they would catch or, capture you and take you and, and make you a slave. Slavery was often something people voluntarily took on themselves. They chose to be a slave. You say, why in the world would you do that? The same reason you go to work every day because you have debts, you have bills to pay, you have families to provide for. And slavery, for many people in ancient times, that was the only way they could live. Slavery, you know, again, we think of slavery, we think of, of uh, people picking cotton in the fields, right? But understand, in ancient times, slavery is you could have been a slave and been a doctor, a teacher, a, a house manager, a manager over other, a supervisor over other people. You could have been a financial manager. You could have been all kinds of things as a slave, you weren't the guy necessarily who was out doing the back-breaking work and getting beaten if you dropped something, right? And, and what I want to say to you this morning, it's, it's a big economic system that is different than what many people think. And we don't have an exact category for this today because uh, we have jobs and we can move from job to job. But again, as I say, somebody, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be so easy. And so you're kind of stuck where you are because nobody else is going to pay you that much to do that, Right? Uh, you're kind of stuck where you are. Um, you can go start a business and work for yourself. Some of you have done that. And uh, the difference between those two things is pretty astounding, isn't it? Going to work for somebody, and that other person, that business owner, he's the one, or she's the one who's going to take responsibility and make sure you get paid every week. They're going to make sure you have health insurance. They're going to make sure you have a job to go to. There's a lot of pressure on that business owner. And, and, you know, if you try to go start your own business, you know it's just hard, hard work. And you got to go and get customers. And you got to go and do jobs. And you got to go and take care of all this stuff. And I've talked to business owners who say there is amazing pressure, incredible pressure, knowing that at the end of the week, you got to write paychecks. And if you don't have money, you're going to be in trouble. And, and, and so there's a big difference. And, and some of your day, you know why you go to work every day for a company? Because it's a whole lot easier than being a business owner. Now, transplant that back in ancient times and realize that for many people, uh, slavery is like, man, it's a whole lot easier because I can work for this guy. And yes, he owns me, your property, okay? And, and, um, but, but I have a place to live. I have clothes to wear. I have food to eat. I have everything I need. And I'll do it in exchange for working. Okay, so understand slavery is an economic system. I, I have a friend who recently retired. He used to joke about having to go to work for the man. And that, that was common reference to slavery, right? It's, it's just kind of the way it's, it's been into our culture and come down. Now, here's what the Bible says about Christians. Listen, it's Colossians chapter 4. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness. Now, when I say the Bible condemns the injustice and the unfairness of, of slavery, it specifically gives commands to masters. You make sure that you treat your slaves properly. You treat them with justice. You treat them with fairness. You know why? You know what comes next in that verse, right? Because you too have a master in heaven. And in Ephesians chapter 6 says, masters do the same things for them. Give up threatening knowing that both their master, the slave's master, and your master is in heaven. And there's no partiality with him. You don't get to heaven and say, well, God, I was, I was, the, I was the business owner. <laughs> and God says, I don't care. You mistreated him. Listen, you too have a master in heaven. So here's the scenario. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon, 
and he ran away. And he ended up in Rome, perhaps in prison himself, where he meets this man named Paul. And through Paul's witness in prison, um, Onesimus becomes a Christian. He becomes a brother. And he begins to grow in faith. And, and again, we don't know the exact timeline. I kind of imagine, just based on how this works out, Paul was with Onesimus long enough to know that Onesimus was a good and faithful Christian brother who was helping him immensely in his ministry, even though Paul was in prison. Now, how would that happen? I kind of tend to think maybe Onesimus was in prison with him. And through that event in prison and their interaction in prison together, Onesimus got saved, and Onesimus began to work alongside Paul in the prison. And, and sometimes people from outside, they were allowed to, to have uh, visitors. We read in Acts that while Paul was in chains, that, that people would come, and, and they would have Bible studies and preach and teach the gospel to them. I don't know exactly how it worked out, but, but Onesimus had been with Paul long enough for Paul to say, Onesimus is a true and faithful Christian brother. And yet, Onesimus also um, is a slave, and he has certain responsibilities to Philemon. And Philemon's a friend of mine. And Paul says, you know, Onesimus, you got to go back. you got to make that relationship right. Wait a minute, doesn't the gospel free him from slavery? The answer is no. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, Each man must remain in the condition that he was when he was called, when he's called to be Christian. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. If you're able to become free, do that. But if you're called while a slave, you're the Lord's freeman. See, see the gospel didn't naturally change or automatically change the conditions of life that we live in. The gospel doesn't promise to make us rich. The gospel doesn't promise to make us independently wealthy. The gospel doesn't promise to make it so we don't have to work. The gospel promises to save our soul for all eternity and to change the way we view life now. If the gospel promised to make us rich, boy, wouldn't life be better? Probably not. But you got to understand what the promises of the gospel are. Now, as Paul writes this letter, he starts here in verse number one. Let's dig into the text here. Paul's a prisoner. Timothy, you're familiar with the name Timothy. He was with Paul there. He writes to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. Philemon is, is the, the master. He is the, the rich guy, so to speak. Uh, Aphia, our sister, probably, probably um, Philemon's wife. Archippus, our fellow soldier, possibly... Philemon's son. But all three of these people, Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus, had all established a Christian testimony that the gospel was at work in their lives. They were growing spiritually. Now listen, when you're growing spiritually, it will be evidence in your life. Look at verse number four. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. Every time I pray, I thank God for what he's doing in your life. Because I hear of your love and the faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Every time I hear Philemon, Paul says, I hear of his love and his faith, not just towards the Lord Jesus, but to other people. When it comes to relationships in Christianity, many of us are, are quite satisfied with the relationship with Christ. We are far less satisfied with relationships with others. And in fact, sometimes we view the church as a necessary evil, and sometimes as not even necessary. I don't want to be around all those people. I can just have my God and me, and we can, you know, God and I can kind of do our thing on the side. I don't need the church. And I want to tell you just as kindly and lovingly as I can that you need the church, and the church needs you. God did not make Christianity a solo sport. The Olympics, Olympics were just over. You remember the Olympics? There's team sports, and there's solo sports, individual sports. Christianity is a team sport. It's something we do together. That's why he can write to the church in your house. Because Philemon and Aphia and Archippus, with whatever amount of wealth they had, it was not enough for them to kind of squirrel off and, and hibernate somewhere and do their own thing. They needed to be a part of the church. Their money didn't exempt them from that. You and Jesus is not enough. 
You need the church. You need people around you who are going to walk with you through the trials and difficulties and struggles of life. You need the church, and the church needs you, and that love and faith which you have towards Jesus and toward all the saints. All the saints. And it's just always like, well, Jesus, why all? Why, why can't we just say the saints or some of the saints? Because like, I had a friend, he's a, he's a pastor, he says this, many a strange bug does the gospel light attract. On these summer evenings, you know, you, gotta, you get home, the, 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 the light outside the door is on, and you've got to open the door and get in really quickly and, and close the door really quickly or else all the bugs come in. And some of you, frankly, kind of treat the church that way. Let's get in really quick so we don't get too many weird people in here. The strange ones. And you look across the church and say, yeah, man, I'm so glad they're sitting over there. And, and you em- emphasize over there. Because God help us if they sit too close to me. Right? But, but, the, but the, the gospel is at work in changing people so that we develop relationships with all the saints. Now, again, not all those relationships are of the same depth or the same way. In a church this size, it's, it's almost impossible to know everybody in any meaningful way. But we look around, and, and we are one body in Christ. One body in Christ. And I've asked this over the last year and a half particularly as we went through this whole pandemic COVID thing. Pray for church unity. Pray that we would be one body, one church, and have love for one another. And, and, and love for one another means we're going to tolerate some things that, frankly, make us a little uncomfortable or make us feel a little awkward at times. Or we're going to, we're going to love people who see things so vastly different than we do, we can't imagine how they can be that stupid. How in the world can you believe something so dumb? I love you, but you're dumb, right? And that's the way we view it sometimes. And I want to encourage you that when the gospel is working in your life, it's going to change your relationship, not just with God, but with other Christians around you. And if you don't have that kind of growth in your relationship with others, are you really growing in your relationship with God? Can you be growing in your understanding of God and his love for you and his love for them if you're not also growing in your love for them? We like angles, right? God and me, God and them. We're not so big on triangles. God and them, God and me, me and them. All of a sudden, oh, whoa, 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 I'm going to... Listen, one of the evidences of spiritual growth in your life is you are connecting more and more with the church in different ways. Again, not the same way with everybody. You, you simply can't have 350, 380, I think it's how many members we have now. You simply can't have 380 significant relationships. But you can have some. And you need to be in the church and be a part of it. Verse number six, not just I hear of your love and faith that you have. I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Now, what does he mean, the fellowship of your faith? Some of you have a different word there. It's the word partnership. This is the word that talks about the relationships, the partnerships that we have in the gospel, the fellowship that we have in the church. Now, here's what he's saying. I am praying that your partnership in the faith, your partnership in the gospel, as you know more and more about the good things you have in Christ, that that partnership in the gospel will grow more and more. As you understand more about what God has done for you, you're going to understand more about what it means to partner with others for the sake of the gospel. You know why some people are hesitant to have significant relationships in the church? Because you don't understand the gospel enough yet. I know that's provocative. And that's why I'm glad there's a lot of distance so you can't hit me yet. But some of us, we don't understand what it means to love others because we don't understand really what it means to be loved by God. Some of us are still... We're trusting Christ alone. We say all the right things, but there's still some of us that are, that are operating that mindset that I need to be really good so God will like me enough. And that's why you look at other people and say, you're not good enough for me to like you that much yet because you think God likes you because you're good. And God doesn't like you because you're good. I'm not saying you're not good. I'm just saying that's not why God loves you. 
God loves you because he is good. God loves you because he is good. And here's what Paul's saying. Philemon, I pray that as you grow more and more in the knowledge of the good things that you have in Christ, that your partnership in the gospel is going to grow more and more. As your knowledge grows, your commitment to the church grows. Your love of other people grows. And if your love of other people isn't growing, it's because your knowledge of Christ isn't really growing. I'm not saying you don't get more facts in your head. Uh, You know, you come to Evangel, um, we're pretty big on facts. We're pretty big on what this is, what the Bible says. And some of you come to a message and, and a Bible study or something, and you get, okay, now I know what that verse says. But do you go out and do anything with it? You see, that's the test of are you growing in your knowledge. It's not are you growing in your ability to recite Bible verses or recite outlines or, or tell people the truth. The answer is are you willing to live by it? Paul says, Philemon, I'm praying that you're going to live by the knowledge that you're growing in. And Paul's setting the stage because Paul's about to make a really big ask. All right, let's continue. I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the heart of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. I've I've come to have much joy and comfort in love. The spiritual growth in Philemon's life was of great encouragement to Paul. I'm a pastor, and and there are times I look out at, at the congregation or I'm sitting in my office and I'm thinking through the congregation and thinking, man, that's so good to see that person here. That's so good to see that person. Man, it really seems like they're growing. Man, here's a person who's really struggling. And I am encouraged when you struggle. You know why? Because you haven't quit. You haven't quit yet. You're struggling. And you don't like to struggle and I don't like to struggle, but you know what? The only alternative to struggle is what? There's two of them. You can quit or you can die. Otherwise, you're going to struggle. I love to see people struggle, not because I like struggle, but because I like what's going on in your heart when you are struggling. I like the fact there's a war going on. I have great joy and comfort. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Now, again, here's what what Paul is, is kind of doing. He's kind of setting the stage for what he's about to ask. Listen, Philemon, I love that I see your faith and your love that's just growing And I'm praying that it keeps on growing. I love the fact that there's so much refreshing going on. You have done so much refreshing of the saints. You are such a such a such a hope to the church there in your house. This is so great. And I'm about to challenge you on something. I'm about to make a really big ask. So, verse number eight, therefore, since I've seen all these evidences of spiritual growth in your life, therefore. I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I'm going to appeal to you. Now, follow with me here for a moment. Why, do, why could Paul order Philemon to do what was proper? The answer is because Philemon, uh, but the answer is because Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He received direct revelation from God, and with that apostolic authority, he wrote the New Testament, he wrote this letter. Paul had the authority to order people to obey Christ. Um, I don't. I don't have that authority. I can't order you to do anything. Um, you know, I, I drive through Burger King, and even they don't believe my order. I like two Whoppers, no pickles. Uh, would you like fries and a drink? You want something else? No, that just this is what I want. Right? That's kind of the life that we live sometimes. Paul says, look, I could order you to do what's right. I've got that kind of authority. But you know, I have confidence that God's at work in your life. And I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love. And here's the thing. When you're growing spiritually, you're going to have evident growth in your life. You're going to have increasing relationships with other people in the church. And your obedience is going to begin to be more out of love than obligation. Your obedience is going to begin to be more out of love than obligation. You're going to do it, well, then I have to do this. It's going to become, I can't wait to do this. Or, I have to do this, it's going to become like, I'm glad to do it. Why? Because God is at work in our lives. Some of you are not there yet. What do you do when your obedience is not out of love, it's out of obligation? What do you do? Obey. Do it out of obligation. 
But pray that God develops in you in love. And, and some of you, you've kind of developed that in your life where as you mature, you're starting to say, yeah, I do this because I love to do it, not because I have to. I want to do this. Why? Because God's at work in us. Now, what is it that he's going, I'm appealing to you, verse number 10, for my child Onesimus, whom I've begotten in my present, in my imprisonment. He's talking here about the spiritual fatherhood. Onesimus came, Onesimus became a believer, and in my imprisonment, I became a spiritual father. He came, I preached the gospel to him, and, and he became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my spiritual child, and he was formerly useless to you. Why was he formerly useless? It may be that, you know, he was unreliable and unfaithful. It may be he's in Rome. And how much, real, how much work at Colossae can you do when you're in Rome? The answer is not a whole lot. The, 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 back in those days, it wasn't this work from home, work from anywhere thing. You actually had to be on site to do it. All right, so, so he comes and says, listen, he is useless to you, but now he's useful to us both. I've sent him back to you in person, sending my very heart. I wish to keep with me. I, I wanted him here so that on your behalf, he might minister to me. He might help me in my imprisonment. But without your consent, I don't want to do it. Because when you, if you would send him back, your goodness, I want it to be of your own free will, not of compulsion. I don't want to presume that you're going to do this. I'm just appealing to you out of love, out of love for the gospel. Out of love for me, I'm asking you, would you send Onesimus back? But I realize he has responsibilities and duties to you. It would be unethical for me to keep him here. It would be wrong. But I'd like to have him. And so I'm asking you that maybe you would send him back to help me. In fact, verse number 15, for perhaps for this reason he was separated from you for a while so that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. God had a hidden purpose going on. And sometimes God's work in our lives is, is, is hidden. We don't always know. At any stage of our life, it's not clear what God is doing. But what if Onesimus ran away so that he would come back for good? What if Onesimus ran away as an unbelieving heathen so that he would become a faithful brother and fellow worker in Christ. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Yeah, it was worth it. Maybe for a while. Yeah, God was up to some, and, and he leaves, and you're distressed, and, and, and things are going bad because he's not there doing what he's supposed to do, but, but God was up to something. And there are times in our lives where God has a hidden purpose, and things happen, and we don't know what it is, especially, especially in relationships. God is doing something, and, and, and sometimes the events of our lives and the relationships in our lives are conspiring to bring about God's will both in us and in the world around us. And when I say conspiring, I mean it just looks strange. Like, how do all these pieces fall in place that way? And the answer is God's sovereign. And sometimes God is doing some things behind the scene that you don't know about. And the call is trust Him. The call is rest in Him. Because God is at work in every stage of our lives. Years ago, a friend told me, you know, life's an accumulation of choices. And it's true. Life's an accumulation of choices. All of our choices pile up, and that's the foundation of where we're at. And if you want a different life, then make different choices. But sometimes we get to the point where the pile of choices is too big, and also we can't change it. What do we do? We have to rest in God's sovereignty, sometimes God's hidden purpose. You see, the providence of God started years ago in your life. And brought you to where you are. Why are you here this morning? At Taylor. At Evangel. With this group of people. You know, well, this is where I always go. But somewhere in the past, through God's providence in your life, he brought you to this place because God is doing something. God's up to something. And maybe because God is up to something in your life, now he's up to something in somebody else's life. Think about Paul being in prison. That's where he met Onesimus. And that's why Paul can say, I'm, I'll gladly be in prison if it works out for the furtherance of the gospel. Yeah, you know, all things being equal, I prefer to be free. But if the gospel is expanded, 
If the gospel is proclaimed, I'll gladly be in prison because it's not about me. Boy, if we could just learn that in life, it's not about me. It's about Christ and the gospel. We're often tempted to look back in life and think our lives would have been better if we had done this or that. And it's true in some cases. We can point to certain choices we made and certain things that were done to us. And if that hadn't happened, yeah, it'd be different. But would it be better or worse? You ever notice how the fantasies in your mind always turn out exactly the way you want them to? That's the great thing about the fantasies in your mind. You can live whatever life you want as long as it's not real. But you can't actually live that life. Sometimes you look back and say, if only. But it didn't happen. And it's not going to. And as I've said before, whatever might have been will always might have been. But it will only might have been. It will never actually be. And what you got to understand is in all the choice of our life, God is up to something. God is never doing nothing. God is always doing something. And that's what he's doing with Onesimus. When Onesimus runs away, Onesimus is trying to escape. Little does he know the life of, of slavery he's headed towards. No longer a human slave to Philemon, but now a slave, a bond servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no idea. Paul goes in prison in Rome. He has no idea that in the months ahead, he's going to run into a young man from a guy he used to know way back long ago. But God's up to something. And we've got to be confident God is at work in our lives. The question for us can't be, what if only? The question is, what, what next? We don't know where Onesimus' spiritual seeking started. I don't know where your spiritual seeking started. Some of you are here today because you're seeking spiritually. You're just trying to figure out, my life's such a wreck. Where do I go now? I don't know what's going on, but at some point, God's at work. Some of the events of your life have brought you to Christ. Guy told me years ago in a chemistry class in college, he needed some help. And he went to get some help, and the classmate invited him to a Bible study, and he came to Christ. He wasn't looking for Christ, he was looking for help in chemistry. I don't know what your story is. God's always up to something. Now, how do these relationships come together? What are you going to do with the opportunities? Some of you are Onesimus. You're running from God, running from life, and God's at work to bring you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for you, it starts with salvation. Come to Christ. Later on in Colossians 4, Paul can call Onesimus our faithful and beloved brother. A runaway slave is now a faithful and beloved brother. Listen to me. Don't, under, don't ever underestimate what God can do in the life of people. Don't ever underestimate what God can do in the life of people. The most evil, wicked person you detest might one day be a child of God. And if you think that's too much, just look at your own life. Because if God saved you, he can save anybody. Some of you starts with Onesimus and salvation, coming to Christ. You need to cross that line today and say, Christ, I'm a sinner. I am so far from you. But you promise forgiveness, and I'm coming to you. That's where you start this morning. Some of you are Philemon. And God's calling on you for some act of grace-motivated obedience. Paul says, Philemon, I want you to take him back. If he has any debts, if he owes you anything, let me know. I'll pay it. But I'm asking you to take him back, and then I'm asking you to send him back. And Philemon says, no, no, this guy, this guy hurt me. This guy sinned against me. This guy took something from me that belonged to me. And now Philemon has a choice. What's he going to demand on is he going to demand, listen, you owe me. I'm getting every dime of it. Or is he going to say, you know what? I can forgive you because God forgave me. Some of you are Philemon. God's calling on you for some act of grace-motivated obedience in your life. Maybe particularly in the place of a relationship. And God's saying, listen, take him back. 
And your response to that is, you don't know what she did to me. You have no idea how he acted towards me. And God says, yes, I do. And I also know what you did to me, and I forgave you. How can you not forgive them? That's why Ephesians 4 says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just like God in Christ forgave you. How in the world can you who have been forgiven so much demand so little? Some of you are Philemon this morning. God's calling on you for an act of grace-motivated obedience. I don't know what that looks like in your life. I don't know. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a habit. I don't know what it is for you. Some of you this morning are Paul. And God's calling you to step up and challenge somebody through discipleship and evangelism. Maybe you got a relationship and you're, you're, you're with somebody and you're saying, hey, listen, you need to forgive. You need to obey. And I can't order you to do it, but I'm appealing to you out of love. Somebody needs to step up and speak up. And maybe this morning God's calling you to be Paul to somebody and say, listen, I love you. Would you think about what it means to obey Christ right now? You know, the gospel doesn't always change our station in life. It won't make you rich. It won't make you healthy. It won't make you good looking. But it will change your eternal destiny. And it will change your current motivations. You know why Philemon could forgive? Because God had forgiven him. And, and, and if I have been forgiven so much, how can I demand so little? Question for you is, what are you going to do with these opportunities? The grace that you have received is the grace that you're called to give back. As we close this morning, we're going to sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. It's written by a guy named John Newton, who you know was a slave trader. And one, one night in a shipwreck off the coast of Africa, God saved him. And he wrote what is probably the most beloved song of all the Christian hymnody that's ever been written. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And as we sing this this morning, I want you to have two responses. Number one, amazing grace that saved me, that saved you. Amazing grace. Rejoice in that this morning. Sing it with, with confidence that God's grace is good enough for you. And then I want you to sing it this morning with a heart of giving to others. To say the amazing grace that saved me is now the grace that I'm called to give. And rebuild relationships. And seek the fellowship of the body because of God's grace in our life. Let's pray together. Father, you've given us amazing grace in Christ. And there are some people today who are going to enter that grace for the first time by trusting Christ alone for salvation. Call them to yourself. Open their eyes that they may receive that grace. There are some here this morning who are struggling to live in that grace. You've given it to us. You've saved us by it, but, but we're hesitant to give it back out to others because we've been hurt, because others have sinned against us. Remind us as we sing Amazing Grace this morning that Amazing Grace is not just for us. It's for those around us. And you have been called. You have called us who have received it to give it. And so may we do that this morning. May we grow spiritually and show it in the way that we relate to others around us. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Stand together with me as we sing this morning, Amazing Grace.
together. Father, may we who have received so much grace freely give it out. Remind us every day that we are the recipients of that amazing grace. And you have promised good to us. And so we'll trust in that. May we be instruments of your grace towards others. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. It's great to see you. Hey, if you have questions about what I've said, I'd love to talk to you. Have a great afternoon. Uh, See you.